Hey there. Are you still on Industry 3.0? I'd like to hear how it's going. So why don't you pop in one of your 8-track tapes, pull out that typewriter of yours, and type me up a report about it. Oh, don't forget to use carbon paper. Oh, you messed up. You're going to need to use some whiteout, huh? <laughs> and just fax that on over to me when you're done, okay? Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Are your industrial systems running a little behind the times? Well, maybe you need to step up to Industry 4.0. Finally. Already. <laughs> if you need some help, my guest today is Mark Schuerman from Molex. And we're going to talk about Industry 4.0 and what kind of interconnects you're going to need to pull it off. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Molex. All right, let's get started. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Amelia. So, Mark, we're talking about Industry 4.0 today, which is definitely in the news a lot. But where exactly does Molex fit in the factory automation arena? Simply put, Molex has been providing technology that enables devices to communicate and connects them together. So what I mean by that is we've been an integral supplier of communication technology to the major controls, device, and platform manufacturers for decades. If people need a communication stack or a communication card to enable a device or a system to communicate with Ethernet IP, Profinet, DeviceNet, Profibus, you name it, or even some safety protocols such as SIP Safety or ProfiSafe, we've been providing that technology to much of the industry for some time. However, it's primarily been under the hood. So you don't see the Molex name out there, and that association with our role in this space isn't necessarily that well known. Now, on the connectivity side, like I said, we connect devices together as well. Molex made an acquisition back in 2006 of a company called Woodhead Industries. And Woodhead was the company that introduced the whole concept of plug and play wiring into the world of automation back in the 1960s. So in essence, what we're talking about there is taking industrial cable, molding connectors to the end of it so that it has a good, secure, robust connector interface that will withstand an industrial environment or industrial application. And in essence, giving people a full plug and play wiring system that will take care of any wiring need that exists in an automation system. All right, Mark, it seems like we have a lot of legacy issues coming into play here. What do you see as the current state of Industry 4.0? And what do you see are the biggest design challenges we're going to face moving forward? Well, with the digital revolution or Industry 3.0, we have seen Ethernet technology being pushed into the factory floor more and more. And there's been a lot of benefit to that. It's helped people to standardize the wiring infrastructures that are being used to enable devices to communicate with each other. The power wiring systems have been largely standardized as well. And that starts to support scalability and flexibility within people's control systems. However, on the communication side, the Industry 4.0 vision is not yet really being fully realized or supported. So what are people trying to achieve with Industry 4.0? Well, ultimately what people are trying to do is they're trying to get access to more information to help them make more informed decisions in real time. So all the pieces to help facilitate that are not in place yet. And that's more on the communication side of it, not the physical wiring infrastructure side. So if people are trying to access data, for example, in different parts of a plant, or maybe even in different areas geographically, the infrastructure doesn't exist yet to easily allow for that data exchange to take place. In addition to that, the tools to allow people to make safe and secure connections to the cloud are not readily available in everybody's control systems or everybody's devices. And also, information really isn't that freely exchanged, not only from device to device, coming from different manufacturers, but also from, let's say, the control layer on up to the enterprise level. So that makes sense. Now, Mark, in the title of this Chalk Talk, you mentioned control and connectivity. So let's start with control. What does a typical control environment or architecture look like here? Well, as you see on this slide, 
Today's architectures are largely layered. You have your enterprise layer, your control layer, and your field layer, and they're also highly PLC-centric. So what do we mean by that? What that means is that when people design a control system, they are choosing a particular brand of PLC. And once that brand is chosen, that then imposes some restrictions or some barriers on the other devices and the other technologies that are going to be used in that system. So it limits the hardware that people can choose from. It limits the number of protocols or the type of protocol that will be used, either Ethernet IP, for example, or Profinet, or perhaps SIP safety or Profi safe, depending on the safe control system. And at the same time, it also requires a lot of additional engineering and software that needs to be written in order to collect that data from the field and the control layer and to bring it up into the enterprise system. So the IT and OT systems are still largely separated. The security doesn't exist in those systems today to allow people to connect to either cloud engineering tools or use other cloud tools for data collection. And in addition, the devices that are used in these architectures are largely fixed used. They have very limited flexibility. So I like to draw an analogy to say a flip phone that we used to use 10 or 20 years ago. At the left, you see an IO device, which is commonly used in today's architectures. It's a single use device. It's designed to connect IO to the controller and essentially act as a centralization point for that data to then get transmitted to the controller. It's got one function only, just like yesterday's flip phones. That flip phone worked as a phone only. But what people are striving for today and what they would like to have is more flexibility, a control system that will support emerging business models, such as anything as a service, and it will allow them to have more cost-effective use of their design time and their systems to achieve higher efficiencies. Now, as the flip phone has found its way into the past, uh, we've got today covered, right? But what about moving forward? What does tomorrow's architectures look like? So moving forward, what we anticipate is that architectures are going to be much more open, much more distributed. So in other words, devices are going to become much more intelligent. They will have embedded in them the ability to support a number of different functions. They'll be able to support a number of different communication protocols, and they'll also help to more closely integrate IT and OT functionality, pass data much more quickly and much more easily through those layers. In essence, those layers that we talked about in the earlier slide are going to disappear. And whether something is an enterprise device, a control device, and even something that's located in different areas geographically, they'll be able to communicate with each other, perform control functions, support real-time communication and control. If we follow with that same analogy that we were talking about before, the device that we're looking at here would be a more modern version of an I.O. device. So if we think about our smartphones that we're using today, those smartphones compared to the flip phone can allow us to do any number of things, whether it is control the thermostat on our homes, make a phone call, of course, which is what the original intent was of the flip phone, take pictures, go surf the internet to find a bit of information. The modern control devices in the future are going to be a lot more flexible. Imagine a device like the IO module that I'm showing here that not only supports collecting IO or sending signals back and forth between IO devices and a controller, but perhaps it can also be configurable to support safe or non-safe IO devices. Perhaps it would also function as a controller, either to perform real-time control in the network or in a manufacturing cell, or as an edge device, perhaps performing some other edge functionality with that logic control engine. And at the same time, having the flexibility to support all of the security needs, as well as the communication requirements to safely and securely connect to the cloud, sending data or perhaps taking advantage of some AI engines or information in the cloud that's important to the function of that control system or control process. So one of the ways that we'll unlock the full potential of Industry 4.0 is 
opening up the ability for devices that come from different manufacturers, different control system suppliers that inherently communicate with specific industrial protocols like Ethernet IP or Profinet and empowering them with technology that allows them to both send data across devices or platforms that come from different manufacturers, as well as to enable real-time machine-to-machine control without regard for the brand or who the supplier is. Now, those technologies are emerging into the marketplace right now. Things like OPC UA, OPC FLC, or field-level communication, MQTT, and IEEE 802-TSN are some of the technologies that are starting to allow people to do that. So when we take the new hardware design concepts that are emerging, as well as the software tools that are now becoming available, we come up with a distributed control system that looks something like this. We've got a single piece of hardware that now has the flexibility, like we were talking about with the smartphones of today, to support multiple functions. It can function as an I.O. device. It could be a safe device. It could be a non-safe device. It could also support control functionality. People could write logic into it. It could be either a safety controller or a standard controller. And in addition, it will have all of the tools that are necessary to allow people to collect data, send it up to the cloud, and facilitate facilitate remote access if people want to do any remote monitoring or diagnostics of that system as well. And in addition, supporting real-time machine-to-machine control. So this starts to give people a lot more flexibility and scalability from their system design. So Mark, do you have any real-life examples you can share with me? Wow. Thanks for asking, Amelia. As a matter of fact, we certainly do. One of the struggles that people have working within today's technology and today's architectures is they'll have one customer who is requiring that they use a particular brand of PLC. And with that, of course, comes a set of protocols, safety control devices, and so on that they have to use to fit within that control strategy. So hours and hours of engineering time will be invested into designing that system. Sometimes, Sometimes TUV certification will need to also be achieved, which is costly and time consuming in order to get that system thoroughly certified and ready for installation at the customer site. Then if there is a different customer who prefers using a different controls platform, all of that engineering time that was invested in the first system, in essence, cannot be reused for the new system. They then have to embark on a new design with the new PLC platform, the new protocols. TUV certification has to be pursued again and paid for, and it makes it very difficult for people to scale their control systems and the design and engineering time that they've invested into it. Okay, that absolutely makes sense, Mark. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about connectivity. Now, what do you think are the biggest design considerations we should really be thinking about here? Well, when it comes to plug and play technology, first of all, you want to think about the environment where the devices are going to be installed and that the wiring system is going to be exposed to. So typically IP67, I would say, is the de facto standard for on-machine devices and wiring systems, but in some cases, higher degrees of protection may be required. We can support that if necessary. In addition, we want to be considering the international and local electrical and safety standards. Different regions have different requirements, and again, Molex has products that will meet all of those certification and safety standards. And the great thing about this, as I had mentioned before, is that our wiring systems will support all of the common requirements in factory automation systems today. So if people want to use a plug and play system for their IO and signal connections, their control power, their communication, or even three phase motor power, we've got solutions. Excellent. Now, given those considerations, Mark, What kind of benefits are we really looking at here? Well, the very first benefit that these systems were designed to address was the cost of downtime. Plug and play wiring systems became popular to help the automotive industry. If a device failed and if it didn't have a plug and play wiring system, the maintenance people had to physically and literally unwire the failed device and then wire in the new device. The plug and play systems make changing any failed device like changing a light bulb. You simply disconnect it, get the replacement device and plug it in. So that's one of the biggest benefits. 
In addition to that, though, plug-and-play wiring systems help to reduce installation time. People can design an entire system in their plant, test it, debug it, then tear it down, load it on a truck, ship it to the end-user site, and then rebuild it on their site. Having plug-and-play wiring systems that make it very quick and easy to disassemble the entire system and reinstall it reduces quite a bit of labor during that process. We have found that our plug-and-play wiring systems reduce the time and cost associated with installation by up to 70% compared to hard wiring. So with that, of course, you get enhanced flexibility and scalability, and it lowers the total cost of ownership for the end user. Okay, Mark, so earlier you were talking about industrial wiring requirements. Now, can we walk through that a little bit more? And specifically, what do you mean in terms of control power? Sure, Amelia, I'd love to. So when we're talking about control power, what we're talking about is the power in a control system that is powering the devices, the industrial control devices. So the PLCs, the IO modules, things like pneumatic valves. So wiring systems that are available from Mauser that Molex manufactures are largely based on 7 8 inch mini change connectors, M12 power connectors, M23 and heavy duty connectors. Okay, so Mark, you also mentioned I.O. signal. What all does that entail? Yep, so for I.O. signal applications, again, most common form factors that people are using are M12 connectors and M8 connectors. Heavy-duty connectors are also very popular for signal applications. And for output devices, we'll commonly find people using DIN-style connectors. Ah, okay. So what about network communications? I think that one was also on your list, right? Sure was. Now, there's a lot of different connectors that could be used for network communication, but we're going to focus on Ethernet applications since we are talking about Industry 4.0. The M12 decoded connector is, I'd say, the most commonly used industrial connector type to support Ethernet communication in today's factory floors. But there's also heavy-duty connectors that are used for this application. There's RJ45s that can be used either in an IP20 or a circular sealed connector type with an IP67 seal on it. And now we're also seeing Industry 4.0 driving the need for more and more data, more and more bandwidth in these control systems. And the M12 X-coded connector is really emerging as the industry choice for this application. Okay, cool. Now, Mark, I know that in any industrial setting, motor power is going to come into play. Now, what kind of solutions do you guys offer here? Motor power is a very interesting topic here because I'd say it's one of the newer categories where industrial connectivity is being used. For a long time, it was considered unsafe to use molded quick connect wiring systems for motor power. However, we've worked very closely with the safety standards people, both in North America as well in Europe, and we developed a system that's called Brad Power, which you see right here at the top of the slide. So it's the first molded industrial connectivity system to support three-phase power applications in a way that's code compliant and safe. Now, in addition to the Brad Power system, heavy-duty connectors are commonly used for motor control applications as well. Okay, so Mark, what do you think are the most important things to think about when it comes to industry 4.0 designs? Well, from a connectivity standpoint, again, it comes down to the environmental hazards that that system is going to be exposed to. So we want to think about IP rating. We want to think about chemical exposure or UV exposure, and if there's going to be any motion in the application. Again, we've got wiring systems that will fit any of these requirements. In addition, the local electrical and safety code and certification requirements are very important. By and large, globally today, we see there being two main schools of thought. There's IEC and CE standards that, by and large, are driven by the European market, and then UL, CSA, NFPA-driven standards, which are driven by the North American marketplace. Outside of either Europe or North America, you can usually use either of those two, and they'll be accepted. So Mark, I know that sensors are going to play a bigger and bigger role in Industry 4.0 moving forward, but what kind of solutions do you guys have in this space? Well, I'm glad you asked that, Amelia. We've actually collaborated with a company by the name of Conternex, who's one of the leading suppliers of sensor technology in the industry today. 
They've got a very broad and diverse offering of photoelectric, ultrasonic, and inductive proximity sensors, as well as light curtains. And really the main advantages of Contranex is that they are able to provide more sensor distance from smaller size sensors. They've got some patented UV technology, and they've got the IO-Link portfolio. IO-Link technology is a foundational technology for Industry 4.0, and it helps people to achieve a lot of the goals and objectives of Industry 4.0. In particular, predictive and preventative maintenance strategies become much more easily achieved with this technology. Sure, that makes sense. Now, Mark, what about the other pieces of the connectivity puzzle? Uh, What does Molex offer here? Well, Amelia, as a matter of fact, Molex has a lot of other Industry 4.0 solutions. We have an extensive portfolio of antennas, both internal and external versions. We have micro-miniature connectors that are low-profile and space-saving, board-to-board, wire-to-board, and FFCs. RFID products for asset tracking, both passive tags and readers. And we have link power connectors that are cost-effective, positive lock, keyed, and they have terminal position assurance. All right, Mark, this has been quite a lot to take in today. Can you recap your main points for me? Yes, I'd be happy to. Molex has one of the broadest, most comprehensive lines of industrial connectivity products today. We've been a leading innovator of industrial connectivity products for many years, so I'm very confident if anybody has application requirements where they want to incorporate plug-and-play technology, we'd be a great resource to help them solve their application requirements. We have strong networking protocol expertise, and as I've mentioned before, we've been very involved in supplying the communication technology of today, but... We're also working behind the scenes to develop our IAS 4.0 platform to unlock the potential of Industry 4.0. We've got a strong commitment to R&D, and that's going to allow us to maintain a leadership position in this space for years to come. So between Molex and Mauser, I'm very confident that we can provide our industrial expertise to help people achieve their Industry 4.0 goals. Excellent. And I'm going to click that link and go to a mauser.com page for more information. Well, Mark, this has been super cool. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia. It's been a lot of fun and I appreciate the opportunity. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Molex. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.